Hi there, this is Daicho from Integral Zen. A few weeks ago, the abbot of Integral Zen, Doshin Roshi, asked me to uh, put together some preliminary uh, instructions for people who are just getting into the uh, strange lifestyle choice of becoming a meditator. And what, what he requested specifically was that I try to make it possible for newcomers to get a sense of what we're doing and how we practice in our school, uh, which is no easy uh, thing because truth be told, what we do is a little bit all over the place and that's by design. We try to make things relatively flexible and uh, to um, adapt uh, practices to specific uh, practitioners depending on what uh, what level you could say they're at, although that's a, a, a dangerous path to start going down. Nevertheless, there are people who are uh, absolute beginners who don't know how to sit uh, still for more than a few minutes. There are people who've been at this quite a while, but don't know exactly how to move forward. They've hit a plateau. Uh, and of course, there are people who have been at this a very long time and uh, have seen the benefit very clearly, but could use um, a refresher or perhaps a, uh, a, a different take on what they're used to. This is not an easy thing to do. I find it a little bit awkward to press record and just instruct you because I don't know who you are. Nevertheless, I am imagining that you and I are together in the Zendo, and that uh, you are willing to be guided through something that might uh, clarify what this practice can become if you take it seriously. Uh, and in order to do that, I think it'll make more sense if rather than give you specific meditation instructions or guide you through a, a meditation session, um, instead, uh, it would be fun to get you to sit still uh, in a posture that approximates what we seek uh, in Zen. That is to say, with a straight back, with your chin slightly tucked in. Um, ideally, your uh, chest would be out a little bit, your shoulders would be back a little bit, and you'd be sitting either cross-legged on the floor or uh, on a chair, not leaning against the back of the chair. And you'd be uh, receptive to what I'm going to tell you. Uh, I think it'll work better if we try that. Because then, once you adopt the posture and you resolve not to move, I will be able to show you why it's so hard not to move when you're sitting like that and what that means for your practice. And hopefully, if you stick with it just for this one session you'll come away from our little uh, fictitious interaction with a more, so, more, um, well, more solid understanding of what's expected of you and what you can realistically expect of yourself if you take this path seriously. Um, so if you're up uh, for doing that, then please adopt a posture now that looks like you're interested <laughs> or that makes you look like you're interested in uh, pursuing this path. Let's temporarily adopt the posture and, and then take it from there. So I'm going to assume that you are already close to a posture that uh, is adequate for sitting. Um, but just to repeat some of the key points, you want to be upright, and that really matters. And at, at first... It won't be clear why it matters. It can be very annoying. Your back will hurt. You'll be, you'll, you'll be getting cramps. Your legs will hurt. You'll want to move around. That's normal. Uh, and working through some of those early tensions is a, is a big deal. So keep your back straight and make sure that you're really upright. So it's not just that your back is straight. You want to be upright. Uh, the word that people often use is you want to look dignified. And if that helps, then great. Uh, although if you're not the dignified type, then just look like you're not ashamed of existing. 
That's a helpful tip. Sit like you're not afraid to exist. That means your back is straight, your eyes are open, you're looking straight ahead for now, and your chin is slightly tucked in. I don't mean that you're touching your chin to your chest, that's excessive, but you're just tucking it in a little bit and you're raising your head, especially the back of your head, so that it's, it's like you're uh, trying to touch the ceiling with your head um, by lifting it maybe half a centimeter or a full centimeter, a whole inch if your posture is out of whack, higher than you would normally when sitting. And make sure your chest is out a little bit, you know, sit proud with your shoulders rolled back slightly so that you really look like you're um, ready to confront the world, not in a combative way, but just to greet it with all the power that is at your disposal. Uh, I'm not especially concerned what you do with your feet at the moment, your legs. If you can sit cross-legged, great. Just make sure that your knees are lower than your pelvis. That matters. And your tailbone should be tucked in a little bit. That means you're not extending your pelvis all the way out like you're trying to show the world your crotch. No, you, you tuck your tailbone back in a little bit and notice the impact that that has on your spine. It should, if you get this right, feel like you've locked into a state in the body that is surprisingly adequate for long periods of sitting. You wouldn't think necessarily that it'll be comfortable, but if you get it right, it does become comfortable. And discovering that is very empowering because then you don't have to worry so much about the pain of adopting an unnatural posture like this. You can place your hands on your uh, uh, well belly if you want, but ideally for now, you'd actually just be resting the hands on your thighs or um, on each knee. We're not going to get too concerned about that right now. Once you found a posture that kind of sounds like what I'm talking about, here's the test. What happens if you refuse to move from now on? If I tell you, okay, you found your posture, now stop moving. Do you start to freak out? Do you automatically detect uh, things that are wrong with your posture? And uh, do you feel the, the urge to modify your posture, things like that? Just check that out. If I tell you, stop moving from now on, what does your mind do as you remain in this posture? Try that for a few seconds. And see if you can become even stricter about the no movement rule. So have a sense of where in your body you feel stuck, or uh, tense, or wobbly, or just a little bit hyper, and see if you can so ferociously refuse to move that the body actually gets still. Well, assuming that you found a way to do this, here's your challenge now. I'm gonna keep talking but you're gonna stay exactly the way you are. And I'd like you to pay attention to how your body responds to this top-down um, command to stop moving. Just watch what's happening inside you at the prospect of truly remaining still, even at the risk of getting really uncomfortable or freaking out a little bit. Just trust that you can actually handle this and resolve from now on for the rest of this session not to move at all. And the more you commit to not moving, the more the rest of what I'm going to say is going to make sense. And of course, if this recording is helpful to you, you'll probably want to uh, listen to it repeatedly uh, at the beginning of your practice 
And if you decide to do that, then resolve every time to be even more still as you listen. I really think that you'll get a lot of benefit out of doing so. So I'm not going to guide you through a meditation yet. I just want you to remain totally still and allow me to continue talking and see what that does to you, what that means for you uh, somatically and psychologically. One of the things that people often ask at the beginning of a meditation retreat when they have very little experience is why their eyes need to be open. It's not that your eyes need to be open. It's that there is a tremendous benefit in keeping them open and learning to keep them open uh, from the start. If you get somewhere along the way in this practice, you will realize that nothing that happens on the cushion really counts unless you can take it off the cushion. And it's a lot easier to take your realizations off the cushion if you know how to have those realizations with your eyes open. If you're at the mercy of meditating with closed eyes simply because it makes it easier to become concentrated or not to get distracted by the outside world, that's fine, but you really are at the mercy of that uh, physical limitation. And let's be clear about it. Having your eyes closed is limiting. It's not enough, at least in the Zen tradition, to attain a quiet mind. And at the same time, we can't deny that most people want a quiet mind, and that's why they start practicing. It doesn't really matter what people say, they want to get enlightened, they want to become very compassionate people, blah, blah, blah. What they really want at the beginning, usually, is to suffer less. And the only way that a person knows how to suffer less until they uh, have the type of experience that in Zen uh, would qualify as insight is a calm mind made calmer through repetitive um, breathing patterns, uh, filtering everything out, uh, blocking the world out for a while, entering a special cozy place in the mind, etc. But closed eyes have a, a masturbatory quality to, to them. If you keep meditating with your eyes closed year by year by year by year, I suspect that you're going to find it incredibly difficult to make the transition later on to open eyes. And please take my word for it, if you uh, don't believe me yet, uh, it will become important that your eyes remain open. It will help you to stand up from your cushion and bring whatever state you've been able to cultivate into the rest of your day significantly more quickly and effectively uh, if your eyes are open. And it's not that big an adjustment when you get the hang of it. Uh, it just takes a little bit of time at, at first. So keep your eyes open, but keep them relaxed. You're not looking at anything in particular. In fact, you're kind of relaxing the eyeballs themselves, and you're spreading your uh, visual attention out relatively evenly across the entirety of the visual field. When I mention the visual field, I mean the, the sum total of all visual experiences so everything you see with your eyes is part of the visual field. And there are also mental images uh, that come up, for example, when you're daydreaming or uh, when memories uh, show up. Let's include that in the visual field. So when you're sitting, your eyes are open, but they're relaxed. They're not focused. You're not looking at any object in, in particular. You're taking in the visual field as a whole. And one of the easiest ways to see the benefit of doing this is to actually spread your attention out so that the edges of your vision are included consciously in what you're seeing. So instead of looking straight ahead, you're kind of looking at the space around you in a neutral and somewhat indifferent way. And you're making sure that you remain aware of what is at the periphery of your vision. When you do that, 
especially if you can keep your eyeballs relaxed and your face relaxed, you'll find that you can enter a rather calm state quite quickly just by doing that and that it becomes quite easy to remain in that state. In fact, keeping the eyes unfocused and sp spreading the vision out to include the whole room that you're in, for example, um, is a skill that you can cultivate to the point of automaticity. What that means is that you can just sit down to meditate and your eyes automatically uh, relax and you take in visual appearances without any preference or attempt to manipulate your experience. Over time, what you'll find that that does is it'll, it will allow you to walk around the world um, holding that way of, uh, of looking at the world um, quite effortlessly. And you'll probably find that you'll have more space, more psychic space you'll feel less cramped inside your own head. It's a nice little hack. Um, so you're sitting still, straight back, eyes open, and just taking in visual experiences. See what that feels like now. I could tell you to follow the breath, but I think that's, uh, that's an unnecessary complication for now. Uh, unfortunately, in the Zen world, there's a notorious tendency to offer very little uh, uh, instruction. Uh, I think that that is a mistake, uh, at least in the context of uh, Westerners uh, trying to adapt themselves to the strictures of a tradition like Zen. It makes more sense to uh, be more explicit about the, the, the technical aspects of, of sitting. Um, but there is some merit to simplifying the instructions in the way that uh, many Zen schools have ended up doing, which is basically to say, sit down, shut up, and don't move. I'd like to unpack that, though. So the sit down part, you know, we, we've done. You've adopted a posture, and you're sticking to it. That's what the don't move uh, part means. You, you don't move. And the shut up part has to do not only with, uh, you know, don't fuss around, don't, um, don't uh, uh, let yourself get carried away with uh, daydreams and uh, all kinds of mental noise. Um, but really that, that shut up part um, implies equanimity, a lack of reactivity, a lack of trying to interfere with your own experience. So a good way to illustrate that is to get you to, in your current posture, with your eyes open and un, uh, relaxed and unfocused, identify whatever is least pleasant in your body, uh, whatever is most tense, for example, or most uh, uncomfortable. Let your mind settle on those sensations that you would deem unpleasant about your current experience. And don't try to get rid of that discomfort. Just scan the body and see what's uncomfortable. And focus on what is least comfortable. And slowly, using nothing but your mind, see if you can reorient your relationship you reorient yourself to your body and your relationship to your body so that you're less bothered by those sensations that you deem unpleasant. So you're not moving, you're not changing postures, but mentally see what it's like to try to find that sweet spot between um, num numbing those sensations and feeling them fully in a somewhat catastrophizing manner. Just little by little, try to make your mind malleable enough that it can accommodate the discomfort in your body without it being a problem. And see what that feels like. It may mean that you decide to get a sense of not only that area, but the body as a whole 
and to include that problematic area in your awareness of the body as a whole. That tends to make more space for the unpleasant sensations. Or you might want to focus exclusively on the painful sensations and to do so in a way that doesn't exaggerate them but reveals them in ever greater detail. Try alternating between those two. On the one hand, get a sense of the whole body and include your awareness of the um, uncomfortable sensations. And on the other hand, exclude all body sensations except those that are uncomfortable and allow them to be clear and vivid. Switch back and forth and see what happens as you try both of these. You may find that one method works better than the other, but actually these are both valuable methods. Um, the key word here is equanimity. In Zen, we sit long hours, uh, it's uncomfortable, it can be a little bit um, intense, and you've got to find a way pretty quick to make it work for you, otherwise you'll just uh, freak out and want to leave. There's a huge payoff to learning to sit still without moving, um, and an aspect of that payoff is that your general levels of equanimity in life uh, increase dramatically over time. And the ability not to be rocked by painful sensations or by um, fears of what will happen if you don't move or if you don't get your way or if people don't accommodate your needs, etc. That's a huge gift. Equanimity or a lack of reactivity is one of the most important skills you can develop in the Zen tradition. Like I said, we sit a long time. If it's on retreat, for example, you know, you can realistically count on sitting in between 8 and 12, maybe 14 hours a day, um, which, of course, is intimidating at first. But if you can get the posture right, if your eyes are open and relaxed, and you're not adding a lot of tension to your body, you're not unconsciously tensing up to keep yourself going, then you'll find that you, you're you actually quite a resourceful person, and maybe you didn't know it. In that sitting, in that stillness, you will find that there are many ways that your mind can rearrange itself in relation to the body so that you suffer less. And that, of course, is one of the key lessons that you have to learn. Um, the earlier, the better. There is a way to manage your experience of pain that empowers you. It empowers you because it trains you to think in terms of cause and effect when it comes to pain. And of course, in the Buddhist tradition, thinking in terms of cause and effect is one of the key markers of real practice. The more you learn to think causally, the more you are going to, over time, trust that as long as the causes and the conditions are right, certain consequences will ensue, which, if you think ahead of time, and if you plan for them, will be to your benefit, and they'll be tremendously helpful. For example, when you realize that sitting daily uh, for a certain amount of time um, does something for you, whatever that may be, it clears your mind, it makes you feel refreshed, it makes you feel strong, it makes you feel concentrated or powerful or enlightened, great. The more you can actually learn to trust that those benefits will come as a result of practicing a certain way, the more you will be motivated to practice in that way. At first, you don't know what the results are going to be or the payoff just isn't clear. Why am I sitting in pain like this? Why am I not moving? Why am I doing this? But maybe over time you'll find that simply by sitting like this and not moving and learning to manage your experience uh, mentally, you'll discover within yourself a capacity to handle greater and greater depth of intensity of um, uh, uh, heightened awareness 
of what's happening inside you, and that this will be a positive thing. The truth is most people have absolutely no idea how much they suffer unnecessarily. And one of the main ways that they suffer is they don't know how to be in their own bodies. They don't know how to sit still and do nothing. And if you think about it, that doesn't really make any sense. Sitting and doing nothing ought to be the easiest thing in the world. And yet for most people, it is the hardest thing. It is harder to sit still and do nothing for an extended period of time than to get up and do something or you know, take over a company, become CEO of a Tesla. It's, it's, it's hard to just do absolutely nothing. And we have to concede that at first, even if you're trying to do nothing, you're doing something. Whether that's trying to manipulate yourself into being still or trying to convince yourself that this is going to be worth it or you're daydreaming about what it's going to be like when you're enlightened or whatever, you're doing something. Your mind is always busy, even if your body is quiet. Nevertheless, if you truly commit to stilling the body, you will find that the mind follows suit. And this can be wonderful to notice when it's really happening, when it's a big shift. It's hugely inspiring to realize that a concerted effort to remain still at the physical level translates into an increasingly quiet mind. You may not find this to be true straight away. In fact, one of the things that is likely to happen if you uh, attempt to sit still like this uh, in a sincere way is that the mind actually gets noisier. Stuff happens that um, surprises you. Memories come up. Uh, emotions come up that you didn't expect. Um, bizarre cramps seem to pop up out of nowhere. Maybe they're psychosomatically um, originated or maybe it's a real thing. Regardless, the mind gets busier at first, and that's okay. What do you do with the mind when it gets busy? Well, that depends. At first, you're very likely confusing the effort that it takes to be still with the intention to be still. Effort and intention are not the same thing. And that sounds obvious when it's said out loud, but... In practice, almost nobody has a clear understanding of the difference between effort and intention. They have to learn it the hard way. What do I mean by that? I mean that intending to be still will produce a very different effect than making a big effort to be still. Holding an intention is a rather simple thing. It's a mental thing. You, you become clear about the goal and you allocate as many of your conscious resources as you can to celebrating and holding that intention in your mind. So let's see if I can guide you through that so you can see what I mean. Try now generating an intention to sit even more upright, but in a much more relaxed and sustainable way. Don't actually try to sit upright in a more relaxed way. Just form the intention now in your mind. Something like this. It is my intention to sit very still, upright, in a very relaxed way. It is my intention to be still, upright, and very relaxed. Just let those words repeat in your head and listen to the words. Listen to yourself having those thoughts. Is my intention to remain very still and upright, not move, and remain relaxed. And notice that the more you actually pay attention to that intention, the more you actually listen to yourself formulating that intention and um, pay careful attention to the impact that that has on your body and your state of being, the more you'll see that the simple act of generating and sustaining an intention has an impact on your physiology, on your state of consciousness. Remember, we're not making an effort to change anything. We're just generating that intention. Keep generating it. it, it it's really going to be worth your while to do this properly. Hold an intention to be still, relaxed, and upright. 
and do nothing but hold that intention. That means that even if your mind wanders or you're having plenty of thoughts or you get distracted by my words, nevertheless, 70% or 80% of your attention is on this intention to be still and relaxed and upright. Notice that the more time you spend generating and sustaining that intention, the more you are primed to actually enact or manifest that intention. That is to say, if you are serious about generating that intention in your mind and you really pay attention to what it feels like to hold that intention, the more your body will start automatically relaxing and wanting to be upright and you'll be able to do that in a way that doesn't cause you any uh, great stress or strain. This can be a remarkable thing to notice. Simply by generating that intention, you actually empower yourself to um, uh, meet your goal. It's very different from making an effort, because efforting comes after you've generated the intention, and it usually involves making a, a physical effort um, combined with a mental effort uh, and not being able to separate the mental effort from the physical effort. You know, you might tell yourself mentally, come on, sit straight, and sit still, and relax, whatever. And you might physically tense up in order to do that. But notice that tensing up in order to relax is not exactly helpful. Nevertheless, the body automatically does that. It's a rather amusing thing. If you start trying to chill out, if you start trying to be relaxed and still, your body and your mind will not be coordinated properly at the beginning, most likely. One of the key lessons there is that if you can learn to operate at the level of intention when you meditate, you will find that the whole thing happens much more easily and much more fluidly. People tend to work themselves up when they start sitting um, by thinking that it takes a lot of effort to follow meditation instructions. That's not really true, although there's a sense in which it's true. It's not the effort you make that'll get you there. It's the clarity of your intention and the um, effectiveness of your actions in conjunction with that intention. That's the golden ticket. So you're sitting here now, you're still, you're silent, You've sat down, you've shut up, and you don't move. Great. Now just generate an intention to remain this way and stay with the intention and watch your mind as you hold that intention. You don't even need to worry about your body right now. Just watch your mind as it holds an intention. Just watch. What does it feel like to hold an intention consciously? If you're like most people, you'll find that the more you pay attention to what it's like in there, in your head, when you're holding an intention, the more you are capable of trusting the outcome of the process without really uh, managing it or micromanaging it. If you can train yourself to do that sitting uh, period after sitting period after sitting period, you're going to make that an automatic habit. You will, over time, learn to operate out of intention more and more often, which is utterly life-changing past a certain point of practice. I don't know how to stress this enough, and I don't want to make any uh, false promises or oversell this to you. But if you really want to uh, benefit from this quickly, that will be one of the first things that you focus on. You focus on the simplicity of maintaining a posture and generating the intention to be comfortable in that posture. That alone, done diligently, might surprise you. But of course, that's not the whole picture. You also need to maintain an ongoing relationship with your body. Throughout a given uh, uh, session, 
you want to make sure you're not numbing your body. Most people are so incapable of connecting to their bodies that they don't even realize that they have zero access to their bodies most of the time. They have a purely conceptual understanding of what it means to have a body. That means that if you tell them, pay attention to your foot, they'll identify some sensations down there that correspond to the foot, and then they'll make a mental image of their foot, and then they'll focus on the image, and they won't realize that they've lost track of the actual physical sensations in the foot. People do this all the time. And it's important to be able to remain with the actual physical sensations of your body. You see, it's by reconnecting to the body in practice that we make the fastest progress. The body stores all kinds of stuff that we find threatening. All that tension that you carry around is protecting you from something. Something from the inside, something from the outside, who knows. We accumulate tension over the years. And we forget that we build up that tension. So it, it becomes unconscious. And certain body parts end up feeling a bit spastic and they don't really correspond to our ordinary understanding of the body anymore. They feel like threatening presences from the outside that we have to clamp down on or numb. And that's a tremendous shame because it reinforces this mistrust of the body. And coming to trust your body will only help. There's no sense in which reconnecting to the body is a bad idea in the long term. Although, here's a caveat, if you are extremely disembodied or if you have severe anxiety problems or things like that, then you can expect that by reconnecting with your body like this, your emotional life may become a little bit more intense because you're no longer capable of blocking certain feelings out. It's astonishing, but sometimes people actually stop there. They can't handle it. Um, they, they hate the feeling of, uh, of being connected in an ongoing fashion to the whole of their body. And so they either um, stop meditating or they find ways to bypass the body. Uh, they, they visualize things, they, they uh, get into extremely deep states of concentration um, because they are afraid of the implications of remaining alert and present to the body on its own terms. Please don't give up if that's the case for you. There is a big reward at the end of this if you learn to be in the body. Among other things... As you come to trust the body, you'll come to trust pain as well. It's not to glorify pain, but when you can actually handle intense pain in your body from sitting or from illness or things like that, you come to realize that a lot of the suffering that comes from the body has to do with your attempts at an unconscious level to manipulate yourself into feeling certain things or not feeling other things. We don't want to feel feelings that threaten us, that um, destabilize us, that go against our, se our sense of ourselves. And so we push them down. And the result of that over time is that we become uh, a little bit paranoid, a little bit arrogant and uh, incapable of connecting to others in the way that we most crave. And tragically, we forget that the way in which we're... Um, uh, suffering has to do with our own unconscious unwillingness to abide in this body of ours. Uh, at the beginning of practice, you're not likely to find working with the body especially easy um, unless you've engaged in forms of body work that have loosened you up, uh, like yoga and things like that. Uh, but stick with it. I promise that's going to be worth it. So we've got a straight posture. We've got our eyes open. We are formulating an intention uh, to, to remain uh, upright, relaxed, and comfortable. And now we're connecting to the body as a whole. See what you can do over the next few seconds See what you can do to make your experience a little bit more comfortable given these 
guidelines so far. Just sit, generate the intention, and relax into this. Now, in fact, these instructions would be enough if you took them seriously. They are by no means the whole picture, obviously. There's an entire uh, year's worth of stuff that I have not said, and that's okay. But for now, just get used to this slightly artificial way of being. You don't need more instructions yet. You just need to trust that actually doing this sincerely would get you somewhere. See what that feels like in your body. As I say this, if I tell you, that's it, that's all you get, those are all the instructions, what happens inside you? It's possible that some kind of reactivity arises. And if that's the case, good. See if you can generate the intention to be with that reactivity in a relaxed way. Develop some equanimity toward that reactivity in the body, that whether it's cramping or an emotion or your thoughts start racing. When in Zen we recite vows, such as the vow to liberate all sentient beings, it's important that we include an active intention to do so, to follow through on that vow. It's a good idea when you start a session or when you finish a session to... Um, vow to awaken, vow to um, be of service to other people, you know, pick your poison. Not everybody will uh, want to liberate all beings, of course. I don't think anybody really wants to. That's a lot of work. Nevertheless, generating an intention to be of service or to be uh, a positive influence in the world um, using the same principles that we use when generating the intention to remain still can be very powerful. Try it now. Let's assume that you've just finished a meditation session. You're still sitting. You're still um, sitting still. But now it's almost time to get up and you know, go about your day. Try first generating an intention to live the rest of this day exceptionally well. Just formulate that as an intention and, and hold it. Watch your mind as it forms this intention. You're going to live this day exceptionally well. And get clear about what that could mean. What might it mean to live the rest of this day exceptionally well? And as you consider this, you might find that actually, again, your, your state of consciousness shifts a little bit. Um, you may actually find yourself taking that proposition quite seriously. Oh yeah, the more I spend time actually generating this intention, the more I actually feel like I want to follow through. And if you see that, that's good. That's what you should be seeing. There is great power in clearly and consciously formulating an intention when it comes to either the things you're going to be doing within a specific uh, session or what you're going to be doing as a result of that session. So on a daily basis, I recommend you practice generating intentions before and after uh, a sit. A longer term, the ability to generate specific intentions like this and to follow through on them will serve you extremely well, especially when the going gets a little hard and you maybe want to quit or you're a little bit frustrated or you encounter a teacher who has very high standards and you feel a little bit intimidated, just learn to operate from 
this mental space where you hold an intention. That means that when you walk around, you're still aware of the intention and you're not trying to do anything about it. You're just keeping that intention in mind. And over time, what you'll find very likely is that simply holding that intention will predispose you to acting in a way that fulfills that intention. And this is a beautiful thing to behold because you'll notice that it's not you doing it. Yes, you generate the intention, but then the rest takes care of itself. And you kind of have to see it to believe it. At first, it won't really be um, possible for you to trust it unless uh, this has happened to you before. But over time, I think you will discover that clear intention combined with the discipline of sitting still and not moving and developing equanimity um, will be a powerful cocktail. And you can find ways to test yourself. Maybe you can sit for longer and longer and longer until you cannot cultivate any more equanimity. Or you may find that it's valuable to spend an entire, entire hour just generating an intention. And that's your practice. Or you may find that you want to generate the intention that you want to sit and your only goal is to pay attention to the visual field or pay attention only to the body. You can call that the somatic field. Maybe you only want to listen to sounds. That would be the auditory field. Each field, in this case, meaning the domain in which a particular type of sensory experience arises, right? So paying attention to the visual field means that you are especially receptive to all manner of visual experiences, whatever they may be. Likewise, paying attention to the somatic field means um, intentionally remaining with the actual physical sensations of your body and being clear about the difference between what is really physical and what is simply a conceptual fabrication that you call your body. You can also pay attention to your thoughts as a kind of field. That would mean, for example, that you direct your attention to the space in which thoughts appear to occur and you would watch the show without getting involved. Uh, one way to do that is to view your thoughts as a kind of a river or a stream. They just keep coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. And you're taking in the whole river, including the space in which the river flows. So the thoughts come and go, thoughts come and go, and you watch them come and go without reacting to them. If the thoughts are unpleasant or agitating in some way, you train your equanimity toward thoughts. That means you're not reactive just because the type of thought that's spontaneously arising doesn't suit you that day. So what? It's a way to practice. You may find that body sensations are actually pretty okay, that visual experiences are fine, but the, the, there's an irritating sound somewhere, and that the more attention you pay to the sound, the more your body tenses up, the more you feel like you want to make an effort to remain concentrated. And if that's the case, then drop the effort, generate the intention to remain uh, neutral or dispassionate, and return to what you were doing. You may want to wor work on emotions, in which case you could call that an emotional field. So you'd be sensitive to all the areas in your body that constitute emotional experience. There might be pressure in your chest, there may be a kind of warmth or, or coolness or whatever. And you just allow those things to come up. There are many things you can do with each of these um, types of phenomenal arisings. But the easiest is just to be aware of them. And that's why we often tell people to start there. Just be aware of what's happening. Be aware of the room that you're in. Not just at a conceptual level. Oh yes, here I am in my room or here I am in the zendo. But actually be curious. Uh, this is a reality test. You want to check that you're actually present, that you're aware that you're here and not somewhere else. You want to let yourself feel heavy on this cushion, in this room. By training yourself in this way, simply on the basis of what I've said, um, you could get very far. Like I said, there's plenty more to go. But if you take what I'm saying seriously now, you might be surprised how far you get. 
I hope that this has been helpful to you and that this will jumpstart your practice. And if not, uh, well, just generate the intention to forgive me. See you later.